In late spring and summer, I had the opportunity to spend eight or ten weeks with some of our young adults, uh, doing some Bible study with them. It was a, a joy to have some of them sing, complete in the this morning for us. Uh, the first week together, we talked about our completeness in Christ and how that is the foundation for all under, thinking biblically about all the major life issues when you're in that stage of life. Um, in our final week together, we talked about singleness. And in preparing for that study, I read what was unexpectedly to me a very powerful book um, working through a biblical theology of singleness. And one of the things we learned from that book is that in the law of Moses, marriage and childbearing were covenant blessings. Remember that the law of Moses was a covenant of works, right? God told them, you obey me, I will give you all these temporal blessings. You disobey me, I will curse you with all these temporal curses. So if Israel obeyed God, he promised them temporal blessings like marriage and a family. That's why in the Old Testament we read things like, children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. See, that's the covenant of works. You obey God and the fruit of the womb is his reward because you obeyed him. But Israel didn't obey God as none of us do, so they were cursed. And the prophets talk about things like Israel's inability to find a spouse, women begging for any man to be able to, to be willing to marry them because Israel's men were all getting mowed down in battle. They were cursed with singleness. They were cursed with barrenness. They were cursed with the death of their children. But in the New Covenant, when we read in the New Testament, everything is different. For example, Jesus and Paul speak positively about singleness. The Old Covenant never speaks positively about singleness. The only single in the Old Covenant by choice was Jeremiah, who is told by God to be single as a symbol of God's curse on the nation. And you come to the New Testament, and the disciples say to Jesus, after his teaching on divorce, the disciples say, well, then maybe we shouldn't even marry, expecting Jesus to say, no, 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 I didn't say that. And so the disciples say, maybe we shouldn't marry, and Jesus says, good idea, though not everybody can handle that. Whoa, something has changed. Paul, single, speaks positively about singleness. Now, certainly, the New Covenant speaks about the great meaning of marriage for the Christian, but it says that singleness is just as valuable as marriage. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7, in the context of singleness and marriage, Paul says, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. That is not Old Covenant language. So how did we go from singleness is a curse if you disobey to singleness is a gift of God? What changed? Jesus. Jesus changes everything. Unlike the old covenant, the new covenant is not based on our obedience, but on the perfect life and death of Jesus. And in Jesus, we have God's blessing. If God freely gave us his son, he will freely give us all things. Every good blessing is ours in Christ, whether it be singleness or marriage. I need not doubt my present place, we say. We have God's full favor. And as Pastor Eric reminded us two Sundays ago, God is supplying all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So Colossians 2 verse 10 says, in Christ you are have been made complete. And because you are complete in Christ, a single person is no longer incomplete. They are complete in Christ. Okay, but I'm not really trying to preach about singleness or marriage this morning because there's a more foundational principle here about what it means to be complete in Christ. That principle is a rock-solid foundation for your contentment for your purpose, and for your joy in life. So I want us to work through the passage from the scripture reading, 
Galatians 3, 23 to 29, to try to demonstrate this principle. But just a little bit of background first. This letter to the Galatians was necessary because they were being troubled by uh, Jewish Christian teachers who were teaching the gospel of Jesus plus circumcision. They were including in the gospel a requirement of circumcision. What do we call that? What's the word for that? Legalism, right? Taking an old covenant law and insisting that it's a necessary part of salvation. The Galatians should have been told that Christ alone would make them complete. But instead, they were told that Christ plus circumcision would make them complete. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, I'd encourage you somewhere on that front page of your notes to just make yourself a little box and write in it, Christ plus blank. Now, don't fill in that blank because we don't want anything in that blank. (laughs) But just write that for yourself and put a box around it so that you can keep looking back to that. Christ plus blank. And I wonder if sometimes the church has communicated to singles that Christ plus marriage would make them complete. We suggest to them that we're all waiting for and praying for the day when they'll get married. And we make wisecracks about where there are potential people to marry or whatever. And we try to even set them up sometimes. And it's all fairly lighthearted and we laugh and joke about it. At least the rest of us do. But what we're suggesting to them is that they'll be fully accepted in the church when they get married. Christ plus marriage will make them complete. That's a new legalism. We believe that salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone, yet we suggest to singles that in the church, they are lacking something essential until they get married. And so we're all just praying and waiting for that day. What? It's not true. Each man has his own gift from God, one in this matter and and manner and another in that. All right, but beyond that particular issue, we should not communicate to any Christian that he is lacking anything essential if he has Christ. Okay, so let's follow Paul's argument here at the end of Galatians 3. Uh, Begin with me in verse 22. But, but, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin. I know some of you teach your kill, children not to say shut up, which is good. But you should also teach your children that there is one circumstance in which they're allowed to say shut up. And that is when talking about the role of the law. The law shuts us all up under sin. The scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. All right, pause right there. So you can see that he's talking about before and after Jesus. Before Jesus came, we were kept in custody under the law. This is the language of jail. The law was like a jailer who wouldn't let us go. The law said, if you obey, you'll be blessed. You didn't obey. You didn't obey. You didn't obey. Oh, you messed up. You sinned. You sinned. You sinned. You sinned. You see that? It's like the law takes chains and wraps them around you and around you and around you and around you. And the whole time it says, oh, by the way, if you just obey, you'll be blessed. Oh, you didn't obey. 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 The law keeps reminding us that we haven't obeyed and we are cursed instead of blessed. The law keeps saying, see what you did? See what you thought? See what you said? You're a sinner. You're a rebel. You don't have God's blessing. You're under God's curse. The law is like a big burly prison guard who will not let you go from the prison of guilt. He keeps bringing your sentence and holding it up in front of you and saying, see, you can't get out of prison. See, you can't get out of prison. I've got you. You are under God's condemnation. You're not in God's blessing. The end of verse 23 says, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. In other words, the only escape from that prison is faith in Christ alone. Your good works cannot get away from the burly prison guard of the law. He will keep pointing out how you have failed. 
Before Jesus, we were imprisoned in guilt and condemnation. But when faith in Christ was revealed, we were shown the way of escape. Verse 24, Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. The Greek word translated tutor here is impossible to translate into one English word because we don't have a person quite like this. But I think the best uh, idea or picture that we probably have similar to this is if you've read a book or maybe watched a movie where there was a strict governess. Have you seen one of those ladies or imagined one of those ladies in a book or something? Um a strict governess whom it seems like you can never please, you never do everything right. She's always pointing out everything wrong, always stern and harsh. That is uh, very much the picture here. Paul's talking about a harsh disciplinarian. I mean, specifically, he's talking about the slave that would be hired by a rich Greek or Roman family to take care of their child from about the age of 6 to 16. But we know from uh, from some of the documents and stuff that we have from that time period, that these um, paedagogoses had a, a, a reputation for being very harsh, very strict disciplinarians, right? And so um, if, if you picture like that governess, you know, one of the things that you hate to do with a strict governess is try to eat a meal because they know all the rules of etiquette and stuff and you can't do anything right. Everything you do, the whole meal is wrong, right? That, that, that is the picture here, that the law, you can't please it. It just keeps saying, no, you did that wrong. 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 Now, but the difference is that with that governess, that those pictures like in books or whatever are often of someone who's unfair and overbearing. The law is not unfair. When God's law points out all the things that we're doing wrong, it's right. It's true. It's fair. But as verse 24 says, the strict governess of the law leads us to Christ, imprisoning us until Christ so that we'll know we're never good enough and we'll cry out for justification by what? Faith. Because we'll know I can never please the law. I can never do it. I keep sinning. I must be justified by faith alone. The grace of God has rescued me from fear, regret, and shame. So, verses 25 and 26, but now that faith, faith in Christ, now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. See, when one of those kids in Roman culture reached that age at like 16 or 17, where they were finally released from that tutor, that strict disciplinarian, it was a celebration. They got a new toga, really, uh, that showed they were full adult, full privileges in Roman society, and they probably could have cared less about some of that, but they really cared about being done with that person who had driven them crazy for those years. And this is what Paul is saying happens when we are saved by faith in Christ, we become like a grown-up son with full adult privileges in God's family. Now, I know that the Bible talks about us like babies who need the milk of the word and we need to grow. That, that picture is true in terms of your practical spiritual growth. But in terms of your standing in God's family, from the first day you repent and believe the gospel, you have full privileges as, as an adult son, Okay? It seems impossible for sinners like us. We're supposed to be cursed instead of blessed by God. But as Paul said earlier in Galatians 3, Jesus became a curse for us. And by faith in him, we're given full status as adult sons. Paul wants to make sure you understand that this is true for every believer. In verse 26, he uses the emphatic you, and then he uses the word all. You, yes, you, yes, all of you. You have full status as adult sons in God's family by faith in Christ. And some have suggested that verse 26 is the capstone of the entire letter to the Galatians. Everything before it comes out from it and everything, I mean, everything after it comes out from it, everything before it leads up to it. Then verse 27 makes the same point in a different way. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have 
clothed yourselves with Christ. Clothed yourselves with Christ is, is another way of saying you are full adult sons with full privileges in God's family. So he says, all of you who have been baptized into Christ, baptism symbolizes that we are clothed with Christ, that we are brought together with him. We immerse people in water to symbolize that we are immersed into Christ. We are fully clothed with Christ. Christ becomes ours. All of his privileges and blessings become ours. Why are you made a full adult son with full privileges in God's family? Because that's what Christ is and you are brought together with Christ. You are clothed with Christ. Like I said before, a Roman youth would receive a new garment when he graduated to adulthood. When we come to Christ by faith alone, instead of trying to wear the garment of our own righteousness, we are clothed with Christ. And when God looks at us, he sees his perfect son. So think back to the problem in Galatia. Teachers who were teaching Christ plus circumcision. You see what Paul's saying? You have graduated from the law. You have become full adult sons. You are clothed with Christ. You don't need Christ plus anything else. Certainly not circumcision. Now, that debate about circumcision might seem kind of irrelevant for us, but Paul suddenly in the next verse shows that the principle applies broadly to all of us in all our life circumstances because he says in verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay? Because you are clothed with Christ and complete in him, there is neither Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, female, all are one. Now we need to answer the question, one what? One what? Does it mean we're all the same? I think we know it doesn't mean that. Does it mean we all um, love one another? We all get along with one another? We're all unified? That's how many people would take it. But what's the common theme that runs through the three pairs Paul uses? Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, female. Okay? The common theme is not that none of those people get along, though sometimes that's true. Those pairs represent issues in which the Galatians would have given one of those two groups much higher status than the other. Okay? In that culture, well, first of all, in, in this religious culture, Jews would view themselves more highly than Gentiles. Though, of course, as is, was true then and is true today, every, many other people look down on the Jews and view themselves more highly than the Jews, right? Slave and free was the most significant social dividing line in ancient cultures. You were a slave or you were a free man and never the two would mix. Male or female, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, some of the differences in the ancient cultures. You know, women not allowed to have any education, things like that, still in some cultures today. There's a famous Jewish rabbinical prayer from the second century AD that basically says, I thank God that he didn't make me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. So what is common of all three of those pairs is status. One group in each of those pairs had much higher status than the other. So I believe Paul is referring to one status. All who have been clothed with Christ have one status. They are complete in Christ, and so they are one in importance, one in meaning, one in significance, one in privilege, because they are all full adult sons in God's family. That, that doesn't erase our differences and our distinctives. The church is a wonderful place because we aren't all the same gender. We don't all have the same gifts or skills or roles, and that's a sweet thing. But our distinctives don't give us extra status. We are all sons through faith in Christ. We are all clothed with Christ. I don't have time to talk about this, but that was a radical thing for Paul to say about women and to say about slaves and to say about Gentiles. Radical. All right, let's finish the passage. Verse 29. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according 
to promise. And as he said earlier in Galatians 3, that promise is God's blessing, right? That was the promise to Abraham, God's blessing. So what does he say here? If you belong to Christ, you have God's blessing. You have it. Jewish, male, free men who are clothed with Christ have God's blessing. Gentile, female, slaves who are clothed with Christ have God's blessing. They don't need circumcision or Christ plus anything to give them status in God's family. You cannot add to what you already have if you are clothed with Christ. What clothing could you add to yourself that could add to his greatness and his perfections, his inheritance and his status? What do you think you can put on to add to that? I need not hold to lands and goods nor strive for treasures base. I need not long for things I've lost for I am saved by grace, not my righteousness, not my works, not my clothes. You have God's blessing. God's promised blessing is all yours in Christ. That's how Paul finishes that section. Okay, so we finished the passage. Now let's expand on the principle a bit and then we'll be ready to apply it. Uh, back of your handout, a brief list. If you are clothed with Christ, you have full standing in God's family and kingdom as full adult sons. You have full value. You are entirely precious to God. Look with me at the beginning of Galatians 3, verse 29. And if you belong to Christ, that's a sweet little phrase, if you belong to Christ, not only are you clothed with Christ, but you belong to Christ. As his precious people whom he loves, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You have full value. Thirdly, you have full blessing, as we just said. The promise to Abraham is yours. Or as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, in Jesus, every promise of God to us is yes. I love that. Number four, if you are clothed with Christ, you have full opportunity to fulfill your God-given purpose. I don't have time to go back to Galatians 1, but Paul says, uh, they didn't know what to think of me when I came to the churches, but they ended up glorifying God in me. You, for your life to glorify God, for your life to have great meaning and significance, all you have to have is Christ. You get life abundantly in him, and in Christ your life takes on immense meaning and purpose. You do not need Christ plus anything to have meaning and purpose. Number five, you have, if clothed with Christ, full capacity for joy. John 16, verse 22, Jesus promised his followers that after his resurrection, their hearts would rejoice and no one would take their joy away from them. Now, we can take our joy away from ourselves a lot. I know that. But we have the right, we have full capacity to joy in Christ that no one can steal from us unless we let that happen. Right? Jesus said that he was writing and speaking these things so that his joy would be in them and their joy would be full all the way to the top of the cup. If you are clothed with Jesus, you have full capacity to greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, 1 Peter 1, 8, and no one can take it away from you. Okay, so here's the principle. If you are clothed with Christ by faith alone, you have full standing, value, blessing, purpose, and capacity for joy. You are complete, Christ plus nothing. Okay, now let's start the application process. First of all, let's start with Galatians 3, verse 28. Let's apply that principle to those categories. Jew or Greek, okay? Skin color and ethnicity do not add to or diminish your completeness in Christ. Though humanity loves to think that skin color or ethnicity gives superiority, it is not true in Christ. Anyone from any race is complete if clothed in Christ. Slave or free, we hate slavery and we should fight against it, yet the slave stuck in his slavery has full standing value, blessing, purpose, and joy if he's just clothed with Christ. 
even if there is never a means for him to escape that slavery till the day he dies. Male or female, doesn't matter. Clothed with Christ, you are complete. What if we apply the principle to singleness since we started with that this morning? Is a single person always a little bit incomplete? Always hoping for that one person who will finally complete them? Are they kind of like half a puzzle and the other half's just always not there? Are they always a little bit of a second-rate category in the church while we all wait for them to get married? Do they need Christ plus marriage? No. A single person is a glorious testimony to our completeness in Christ. Now, that in no way means that God's purpose for them might not include marriage at some point or that they would not be, it would not be appropriate for them to desire to be married. It does not mean any of those things. But it does mean that right now, today, they are complete. Their kind father is not withholding any good blessing from them. And in 1 Corinthians 7.35, Paul says that they are uniquely able to give themselves in devoted service to God. They are not stuck with a sad and lonely life and let us stop implying that in the way we talk to them. Christ can give them his own joy. If we are clothed with Christ, we are complete in Christ. Now, let's go beyond race and gender and slavery and singleness. What about age? There are little children with simplicity and naivety, young people with sharp minds and strong bodies, the elderly with wisdom and perspective, the very elderly who sometimes return to being like children as our bodies and our minds wear out. What does it mean in Christ? I don't, I don't say this to be funny at all. I say this in all seriousness. A six-month-old in diapers and a 96-year-old in diapers. What is it in Christ? You know, a six-year-old who's just learning the basics of the gospel and a 96-year-old who can no longer think clearly or quickly, are they, can they both be complete in Christ by faith in him? What about physical appearance? Our culture is so hypocritical about this. Nobody wants to admit what is the most obvious thing in the world, and that is that your status in this culture is based on how you look. It is the strong and the beautiful people who get all the headlines and who get all the attention and who make the money and are more likely to get hired for the jobs. There is no such thing in the family of God. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees us clothed with Christ. And the most mutilated and horrifying physical deformities cannot keep someone from having full status, meaning, and joy in the kingdom of God. This is also true of physical health. One person is full of health and sleeps well and seldom gets sick and is able to spend long days of productivity and accomplishment, and another is full of weakness and sleeps 18 hours a day, or is bedridden or paralyzed, or spends years putting all of their time and effort into battling disease. In Christ, there is neither sick nor well, but all have one status, fully able to live for God's glory and experience full joy. The same is true for those with physical disabilities, the blind, the deaf, the lame, those with you know, growth abnormalities. There is no stigma in Christ. There are no dwarfs in Christ. Clothed with Christ, they are complete. What about developmental dis disabilities? What about Down syndrome and autism and various forms and severities of dyslexia and many other things we could list? Each one who places his or her simple faith in Christ is clothed with all the glorious perfections of Christ. In Christ, those with disabilities have no stigma they aren't sent to a special classroom in God's family. They aren't given a placard to hang from their rearview mirror. They have full status and value and blessing and purpose. And don't we often see that they seem to be the ones who have the most joy anyways? We feel more badly for them than they seem to feel for themselves. So in Christ, there is neither old nor young, beautiful nor ugly, healthy nor sick, disabled nor full of ability. All are complete. Let's keep going. The news dominating the headlines this week was of another famous person taking his own life. And the next day, a local man did the same thing right 
on the street here in Menifee. So what about those Christians who struggle with mental and emotional ups and downs and wrestle with periods of darkness of the soul, deep valleys in their own minds and emotions? If they are clothed with Christ, do those valleys and dark days and confusions and sorrows change their status or their value? Are they not complete in Christ even in and through their struggles? As a matter of fact, it's those truths that are an anchor in the darkest days. Clothed with Christ, I am complete no matter how low my thoughts or feelings may be today. No matter how unstable I may feel today. My stability is not in me. Christ makes me complete. What about education? Education can bestow status or stigma from those with advanced degrees to the adult who doesn't want anyone to find out that he can't read. When I was meeting with our young adults, we, we spent a week talking about Bible reading, and I started that lesson by noting that the Bible never tells us to read the Bible. Right? Go look it up. Now the Bible tells you to meditate on God's truth, to hide it in your heart, to love his law, to seek it diligently. But why is there no command to read the Bible? Now don't you dare say that I said you shouldn't read your Bible. Could it be because through the centuries and today, tens of millions of our Christian brothers and sisters have never had the opportunity for any formal education and have never learned to read. Were they complete in Christ? They never read through the Bible in a year. We have Christian brothers and sisters who never read a verse of Scripture for themselves. They heard it, and they believed it, and they loved it, and they meditated on it, and they never read it because they couldn't. Were they complete? As much as the person with all the advanced degrees who can read through the Bible in a month. Yeah. In Christ there is neither illiterate nor genius, but all are one in status, value, purpose, and joy. What about spiritual understanding? Some have vast Bible knowledge and capacity to understand the scriptures and theology. And they can be greatly used of God in the church, but do they have any greater status than the one who's still trying to learn how to find the books of the Bible? If we have a Bible trivia challenge, and if first place and last place are both clothed with Christ, is there a difference in status? Uh, For pastors, we could apply this to ministry success. Do I think that my life would be complete if I had a successful church, a big enough church, if I made a name for myself, if I wrote books, whatever, like Christ plus a big church would make me complete? Are pastors not complete regardless of anything that happens in their ministries? If they're clothed in Christ? What about your marital status? We've already spoken about those who have not ever married, but what about the separated, the divorced, the widowed? They are complete in Christ too. They are able to live for his glory and experience his joy. In Christ, there is neither single nor married, divorced nor widowed. Our status is in Christ alone. What about your parenting status? What if you are childless or if your children are a heartbreak for you? For old covenant Israel, children may have been a reward for covenant obedience, but there is no word anything like that in the new covenant. No word like that. Nothing suggests that in Christ, children are a sign of special status or approval or that Christ plus children will make you complete. Christ plus nothing is what we need to be complete. What about your legal history? Brothers and sisters in Christ who have committed crimes, who carry convictions, who maybe are even in jail or in prison. If they are clothed with Christ, their prison clothes don't define them. Christ defines them. And they have as much value and purpose and potential joy as the freest among us. What about your financial history? Is there debt? Is there bankruptcy? Is there a history of poor decisions? Debt is a cruel master, but it cannot rob you of the riches with which you have been clothed in Christ. 
There are no special rewards in heaven for home ownership or a large 401k. James says that when it comes to jewelry and clothes and money, make no distinctions among yourselves. Show no favoritism. In Christ, there is neither rich nor poor. We're all heirs of all that is Christ. So is this hitting home for you? Is the Spirit of God shining His truth into your life so that you are seeing the areas in which you have subtly said that Christ plus something would make you complete? I've got two things right at the top of my list. And I know full well what they are. When we say Christ plus anything, whatever we put in that blank becomes our new jailer. And we have created our new legalism. Whatever we think we must have to find completeness apart from Christ is like a master that controls us. Now, I'm not saying that nothing else in our lives matters. <laughs> Education and work and family and finances and all of those things matter. You know, the right response to this sermon is not to go get yourself in jail so that you can be complete in Christ in jail. Uh, in all these areas, we should live for the glory of God. But what we must say is that none of those things are essential None of those things will make us complete. We're already complete in Christ. And so we can live out our lives as he did. And again, it's not that we're called to follow the specifics of Christ's life in practical human circumstances, but it is worth noting that he was single, never married, never had children, never owned a home, never bought an insurance policy or invested in a retirement plan, never had a higher education, was convicted as a criminal and publicly executed. Yet he had more value, more significance, more joy, and he brought more glory to God than any other human being. Now again, that doesn't mean you should copy his circumstances, but it does mean that Christ plus nothing is what you need to be complete. Jesus came to be a servant, to carry out the will of his Father, to love the people who belong to his Father, and to lay down his life for them. And Jesus says that greatness in his kingdom is found right there in, in lowly service to other people for his sake. God might allow us to marry or buy a house or have our freedom or be healthy and we'll praise him and use those things for his glory. But no matter what, we're already complete. I need but trust my father's care and faithful run the race. Right now, today, you have full standing in his family, full value as his own, full blessing and favor, full opportunity to bring him glory and full capacity for joy if you're clothed with Christ by faith alone. How can you begin to state the importance of that news? Take every headline and every article from every news organization on the planet today and it is nothing compared to that news. This is the gospel that you can be complete through faith alone in Christ alone. So be encouraged this morning, but you may need to respond with repentance and faith. Repent of the ways we've said, I think I'll be complete if I can just have Christ plus. And then believe all that God says about our completeness in Christ. God can say it, but we have to reckon those things to be true for ourselves. We have to believe what God says. Mm -hmm.